would be a disaster. Thanks, Maria. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be opening this event today for everyone here. Uh, my name is Professor Marco Thomas. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Greenwich, and and I look after the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences, in which uh, this important research centre, Crell, resides. Uh, I'd like to just begin by just thanking Maria for, and uh, Nancy for all for their customary, uh, typical, uh, excellent organisation that they always have for these events. And and it's great to be kicking off the, the new academic season with this event. Yeah, and, and even though we are meeting on Teams and, and people are starting to feel that <laughs> perhaps we're getting a bit tired of Teams and Zoom now, and we can start doing more things face to face. It's interesting that we've got 42 people already on this call. And I don't think we'd be able to have got 42 people from the number of different locations that we ha now have where we're running this event in Greenwich. Of course, we do want to get back to organising things face to face in the future and probably having a sort of hybrid mix of these things. Although sometimes it feels as if the technology hasn't quite caught up with with the ambition. I think um, today's topic of language in autism is really, really important. Uh, I myself am very interested just in the whole meta language of, of autism and, and designated disabilities themselves, which is often quite troubling. Uh, I think huge assumptions can be made in relation to the linguistic development of ASC children, where the impact of deficits in social interactions can be assumed to underscore cognitive development too. And this really provokes questions in relation to the relationship between language and autism more generally. Alongside this, we've seen a huge amount of greater public awareness around neurodiversity and a growing willingness to move away from neurotypical registers that might lead to homogenized views of behaviors that are deemed acceptable or credible and legitimate in wider society. So I think this topic is really, really welcomed. Uh, it, as I said, it's incredibly important and quite timely as we're all eager to discover much more about this important and much overlooked area of research. So a huge welcome from the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I'll hand over now to our Director of Research, Professor Chris Bailey. Thank you, uh, Mark, and uh, again, welcome everyone to this uh, opening uh, research uh, uh, talk under the um, under the Crow Initiative, um, and uh, uh, welcome to our colleagues from Amsterdam. Um, we're certainly looking forward to uh, to your talk. Uh, Crow has, uh, uh, from my perspective as uh, Director for Research and Enterprise, has been one of the, the fastest growing uh, uh, centres we have within the faculty. Um, really, you know, responding to these societal challenges, and you can see the slide here with regards how uh, language and linguistics is relevant for health, culture, creativity, an inclusive society, uh, digital industry, space. Um, at my area uh, is is in computing and engineering. Uh, so I'm very interested in uh, how artificial intelligence also interacts with uh, linguistics. And uh, you know we hear a lot about computational um, linguistics and then I start thinking about Chomsky and, and, and these sorts of things. So it, it's a very fascinating area but I, I think what really it has impressed me is how we're bringing, which are key areas for for the university, but how Crow is really sort of exceeding in in research, knowledge exchange, and building partnerships. And these three areas really underpin the university's future research uh, strategy. Uh, so uh, great to see uh, uh, the the agenda for today, and uh, and look forward to seeing future successes with Crow going forward. Again, welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. So what you I hope you can see now is a slide that captures the strands of research that we have been carrying out. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. OK, maybe it was an echo. It's echo. Yeah, it is echo. Sorry. Yeah, so um, these are the main strands that we have been uh, developing at CREL and now I'd like to invite the colleagues who are the leads of each, uh, each individual strands to, uh, to say a few words about what is coming up 
in, in the year. I want to thank you also the advisory board members who are present in the call I've seen before because they have been supporting the center from the very beginning and they have insisted us uh, insisted that we gave uh, an idea about all the research that is um, covered under the umbrella of CREL. So um, for some reason, I cannot see all the list of participants, but if Rosanna, if you are there, would you like to say something about the relationships between CREL and the Institute for Life Course Development? Hi, hello, I hope you can see me. Hello, Maria, hello, everybody. I am Rosanna Pacella. I am the director of the Institute for Life Course Development, and I'm really here in support of the very, very strong CREL ILD partnership that we have built over the last two years. Um, I think everyone can agree that it has fostered interdisciplinary research and collaboration across the faculties and really added value um, to, to both faculties. So very, very proud to be here. And you know, just in terms of some recent developments to say that the Royal Borough of Greenwich, we have a very strong partnership with Children's Services in the Royal Borough of Greenwich, and they have been in touch because they would like to focus on speech, language and communication needs in children, and especially wanting us to look at the long term consequences. So looking at health, employment, education and um, even criminal justice, youth offending um, outcomes that are, are linked to language needs across the life course and to also look at the costs, uh, costs of language needs to the community. So very exciting work um, and uh, yeah, very excited to be here and, and to be part of this uh, CREL ILD collaboration. Yeah, well, thank you, Rosanna. Thank you, because the, the ILD has been uh, an asset for CREL, everything we've been uh, building up together. So thank you. And yes, what you've mentioned is, is something very important that is uh, coming up in the agenda. So thanks. Thank you very much for your time uh, all the time and also here today, Rosanna. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. So if uh, let's carry on with the colleague who belongs to CREL and ILD, Anna Samara, who is the lead of the uh, of the Reproducibility Club, which is a very important initiative, uh, a national initiative, and she is the lead that represents the university at UKRN, at the UK Research, uh, Reproducibility Network. Uh, and that is part of the very important movement of open science. So Anna, would you like to say a few words about your, the work that is coming in the year. Yes, of course. Hi, thank you, Maria. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here at the launch of um, the CREL activities for 2021-2022. And I'm here in my capacity as one of the representatives of the Science Practice Hub uh, that lies within CREL. And one of the key activities um, within the Science Practice Hub is the Reproducibility General Club um, that is also aligned with my role as local network lead um, for the UKRN, as Maria already mentioned. So just a couple of brief updates on um, things that happened over the summer, but also on things that we are planning uh, for the near future. Uh, so first of all, I um, represented the University of Greenwich uh, in my capacity as local network lead um, in a summer retreat that took place in July in um, Cumberland, sorry, in Cumberland Lodge, um, where we uh, held very interesting discussions with other representatives from other UK based universities on issues of reproducible um, science and there is many um, interesting opportunities for collaboration across institutions that we will be exploring uh, in the coming um, few months. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, Greenwich University participated um, in evidence that the UKRN submitted to a science and technology committee um, inquiry 
So there was a science and technology committee inquiry on reproducible research and the issues um, of um, problematic bad science practices. And as the University of Greenwich, we also submitted a response and some evidence to this parliamentary um, inquiry. So these are things that happened over the summer and um, we're currently putting together a schedule for the new reproducibility uh, series for the new academic year, probably with an emphasis on um, external speakers coming and giving us information about open science practices and um, techniques that we can use to become better scientists really. So hopefully in the next um, few months we will have a schedule finalized. We will probably be launching the first talk closer to the end of November. Um, so please watch this space uh, for many more interesting talks this year. Thank you. Wow. Amazing, Nana. Very, very good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. And looking forward to it. Looking forward to everything. And thanks for your leadership on this. Thank you. So uh, let's move on to um, to Katarina. Katarina Stenke, who is the lead of the narrative seminars, because we've been speaking about all this corner here of science practice and open, open science. And then uh, we also, Krell also does research on on the strand on the pillar that has to do with creativity and and heritage as well um literature oriented so katarina hi i know that you guys have a full program ready uh, for the year so can you say a few words about it for all the members hi maria, hi, maria. And, and hello everyone i'm katarina stenka i'm a lecturer in 18th century literature can you hear me properly Yes, yes, we can. Fantastic. Well, yeah. um, I'm really delighted to be here speaking as a representative of the co work and I, uh, a wonderfully successful, in fact, narrative seminar series that we started running last year. There's myself along with Associate Professor Justine Bailey, Senior Lecturer Emily Critchley, and, and now and most recently Anna Costantino, all from the subject groupings of writing, literature and language. So we're definitely on the humanities scale of things and we're very proud of what we bring to Krell and you know, very rich and active research cultures have informed our seminars, but we are also interdisciplinary and we've really taken our lead this year to provide yet another successful programme of seminars around the theme of narratives. We've been paying attention to this interdisciplinary dimension. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about okay. what we have planned and I will also post in the chat a flyer for our first seminar of the year, which is happening on the 27th of October. So our our programme this year aims to reflect the interdisciplinary reach of Krell as well as responding to key themes from the university's strategic goals. We'll be looking at building on our successes from last year, reaching an increasingly wide audience. We already had some fantastic sessions last year with speakers and attendees from multiple countries and indeed different continents. So term one, we have themed around the topic of transnational narratives. So we're looking at narratives that describe or respond to the challenges and possibilities of transnational crossings, which seems like such an important topic for us in this present moment. We'll be looking first of all next week at 19th century transnational narratives. We're going back to the past to see what we can learn from it. And we've got some fantastic speakers, um, University of Newcastle and the University of Ghent. So that's our first, first panel. And we've also got a wonderful session organised by Professor Justine Bailey, where uh, we'll have colleagues from the University of Liverpool speaking about a really kind of noxious kind of narrative that has had to be rehabilitated, that is the narratives of enslavement. Okay, amazing, thank you. Oh, I'll speak very briefly about what we've got for term two to term three and then I'll, I'll move on to my colleagues, but it's worth saying that term two we'll be looking at narratives of sustainability and we have a series of panels which combine creative writers with activists and academics within the field of environmental studies. And in term three, we've got narratives across disciplines where we're 
specifically focusing on how to use this kind of concept or this idea or research tool of narratives in different disciplinary contexts. Um, we'll be in dialogue there with a research group uh, from criminology, gender, deviance and society who will be. So we're in short very, very excited to be running this seminar series and we really value and benefit from our association with Corral and the Thieves, um, especially with Maria Arke now specifically working on Thank you very much. All our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Catalina. Very good. We're looking forward to it. And, and yes, please paste, uh, put in the chat the program for next, uh, not next Wednesday, the one after, right? So yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'd like to invite the last two colleagues I'd like to hear from, uh, Neil Saunders and Cecile Laval. Uh, they, uh, they have a very active participation within the centre and they will have things to tell us about what is coming up. So, Neil, go ahead. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, everyone. Uh, very briefly, I'm Neil. I'm a lecturer, senior lecturer in the School of Mathematics and Computer Science and uh, my particular area is in is, is in pure mathematics, but Corel is, is a wonderful research uh, institute where uh, ideas from mathematics and computer science can uh, feed into the interdisciplinary research. But also, just locally in our school, we've recently had some new acquisitions and expertise in in uh, AI and machine learning, and Corel is just the perfect place for us to be exploring those research interests in a wider context as well. So things that are coming up uh, in later in term one, I'm organizing a discussion with uh, a, a lecturer in artificial intelligence to ask what it really means for a computer to understand and, and dig deep down and into uh, how language in very much the Chomsky um, uh, view is there to help comprehension as there as much as it is to um, communicate with uh, with other agents. If one thinks about neural nets uh, that are fundamental to AI, one thinks about uh, automata, which can be deterministic or indeterministic, and lying behind the mechanics there is some sort of formal language and the properties of the neural net can be uh, expressed in terms of these formal languages. So, uh, so we'll, we're hoping to have some more seminars in term two on that, but uh, uh, I'll be advertising those uh, sooner to the time. Okay, that's lovely. We are looking forward to those. Neil, thank you very much. Thank you. And last but not least, before we move on to the talk, uh, Cecile, I know you are here. I saw you earlier on. Very, thank you very much for being on the call. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, everyone. So I am uh, Cécile Laval. I'm an associate professor in uh, second language acquisition. And uh, the um, interface between second language acquisition and, and language teaching, so how do we become uh, better language teachers, which uh, has to start with how do we acquire a second language. But the um, what we want to build on um, uh, further, uh, Maria and I and the rest of the team, is to, within the CREL framework, is really building from the fantastic research our students are doing, undergrad and postgraduate, uh, because we have, as part of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, we are offering languages, uh, French, Spanish, Italian, and Mandarin, and we have a very high level of uh, languages, and students are doing a language research project, and we really would like to have them embedded in, in the CREL uh, talks as well, uh, in terms of not only research, uh, sharing research, but also uh, employability as well to, to showcase what they're doing because they're doing a fantastic job. Um, and and um, in terms of um, uh, uh, inclusivity, equality, diversity, we, we really need to, to showcase as well what, what we're doing. There is, for example, one of our final year uh, uh, highest language level students who's looking at um, gendered language or languages and, and the impact on society and, and what it can do. And that can lead to some very interesting discussion around our students and colleagues and research papers on, on this in terms of, of uh, inclusivity and equality and, and, and all very important agenda. So it's about bringing second language uh, teaching and our second language learners into the center and really uh, building from that research undergrad and our postgrad students as well, of course, and our own research because our team of colleagues working ranging from translation to language testing and, and also second language acquisition or applied linguistic in general. 
So very, very excited and we will have some interesting project coming on. Hopefully we're waiting maybe a little bit for Tom to, to have something on campus um, and, and make, a, make it a, a bit different than online. But um, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Cecile. Thank you very much for this. Yes, all right. So this was the overview of what is coming up. Uh, in thank you very much to all the colleagues who are going to be in charge of leading all these initiatives because this is teamwork, completely teamwork. And all the things that we have in um, on this slide are, is the International Summer School on Multilingualism, which we hope to run again after last year, uh, which involves our visiting professor Mike Putnam from Penn State University, who I think is on the call today as well, and our literature conferences like the Victorian Popular Fictions uh, Annual Conference. So we are very much looking forward to all this. Thank you very much to everybody for listening to what is coming up. Now you have an idea when you receive invite emails what you can find. And finally, I want to uh, introduce to everybody the speakers of um, of today's uh, of today's talk, uh, uh, we you know we Mark has already said we have a talk about language in autism that is going to be delivered by Ileana Grama, Harriet Reynolds, and Janet Schaffer. They all belong to the language in autism laboratory of the University of, of Amsterdam. So no surprise, I'm there that they are here. But well, in any case, they are leading scholars in the topic. Uh, Janet Schaffer, Professor Janet Schaffer is a worldwide recognized expert on the links between language development and extra linguistic cognitive knowledge across populations and languages. She has studied at the University of Utrecht, UCLA and MIT. She worked at Ben Gurion University in Israel and has been in Amsterdam since 2011. She has to be recognized for many achievements in the linguistics uh, in the linguistics discipline. And one of them is that what I put in the blurb that she's been the founding lead of international networks such as the language abilities in children with autism, the, um, where the analysis of language development and intelligence, executive function, theory of mind and coherence provided a more refined picture of human cognition. Uh, together with her, we have uh, two colleagues from her lab, Dr. Ileana Grama, who lectures at the University of Amsterdam. And you may have seen that she got her BA uh, from the University of Bucharest and MA and PhD from Utrecht University in Linguistics. She's an expert in statistical learning, which I know is a topic that some of the colleagues here at CREL are very much interested in and its potential role in language development in infants, adults, and clinical populations. Finally, uh, Harriet Reynolds, um, very close to the heart of many of us because she did her BA at the University of Sheffield and the MA in Linguistics in Amsterdam. She's currently developing a doctoral study on information structure in autistic and neurotypical subjects connecting linguistic areas such as pragmatics or prosody with cognition and psychology. So you can imagine that we are very lucky and I'm thrilled that they are giving us some of their time. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and, and, and see if you guys can share. If you cannot share, just let me know and I will share your slides from my end. Okay. I will try one more time. Yeah. Okay. No. It doesn't work. No. Okay, so then I have your presentation and I'll I'll retrieve it. Don't worry. Just tell me when you want me to pass the slide, although okay. I follow you very closely. So for Harry, I think I can also, I, it seems like it might be working for me ah. if we want me to do it. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, better. If you can do okay. it, go ahead. If you would like to share, Harriet, that would be great. Mm. I think it's my Mac that hasn't been set up well for, for Teams. Mm. <laughs> 
thinking, right. thinking. Yeah. Oh yes, we can see your your screen, Harriet. Thank you. Yes, very good. So you, I'm gonna mute my mic now that we have you all in place. Thank you very much again, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and what an impressive introduction of this uh, Corel Center. I, I kept saying CREL to Ilana and Harriet, but now I know how to pronounce this, Corel. What an incredibly diverse and multidisciplinary and impressive center you have there in Greenwich. Um, uh, you set the expectations very high, so I hope we can uh, meet them just a little bit. Um, I'm very happy that you uh, invited us and, and, and yeah, I think I can talk for Harriet and Ilana here as well that we feel very, very honored to be the speakers of this first Corel event this academic year, year. So Maria, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, I move, let's move to the second slide. Yeah, so here are today's speakers, but Maria did a fantastic job introducing us already and you can see each other. You can, you can see us on the screen as well, so we can move on to the to the next slide, where I will give an uh, an outline here. I I myself will uh, start with a little introduction to language in autism, and um, then Ilana will tell us something about language and statistical learning in autism, and then we'll move on to the topic of pragmatics in autism and all of us will tell you something about that. Ilana will say something about an ongoing study uh, on implicatures. Uh, I will say something about an ongoing study on topic encoding and uh, Harriet will say something about noun phrases and pronouns, which is at the heart of her current PhD uh, project. Um, so what we are intending to do here is just give you a, a little glimpse into the ongoing studies at the moment. So nothing is really finished. We have no big results that we are going to present to you. Um, but we would like to give you an insight in, in, in our group, Language in Autism. And, um, and we hope that you will have good questions and comments about this so that it will raise discussion in this very diverse group of people. OK, so um, what is autism? Let's start with that, with the autism spectrum condition, as it is called nowadays. And I think one of the colleagues here already mentioned you know, the, the meta language that is used um, to refer to autism. We will not say a lot about that, but we are very aware of all the changes and the rapid changes in in the language that we use to refer to autism. So uh, a, a while ago, it was the, the best way to refer to or the, or the most accepted way to refer to also by the population themselves was to say people with autism or people with autism spectrum disorder. Nowadays, we've moved to the so-called disability first um, terminology where we refer to them as autistic people or autistic individuals, autistic ch children um, or people with autism spectrum condition rather than a disorder. I myself am uh, not used yet very much to say condition so I may actually make errors. I'm going to try very hard to, to use the terminology that the autistic population prefers, although I also realize that within the autist population there are different preferences. So forgive me for uh, making errors in this, but um, we're trying to do our best to keep up also with the most accepted uh, terminology. So autism spectrum condition, what is this? Well, according to the DSM-5, which is a sort of a manual that is used in diagnosis of autism, there's two main characteristics that are being mentioned. The first one is persistent deficits in social interaction and communication. And the second one is restricted repetitive be patterns of behavior, interests or activities. OK, now none of these is per se about language. But we can imagine that the first one, deficits in social interaction and communication, communication comes a little closer to language, that that has repercussions for language. So we're going to zoom in to language uh, now um, and I'm going to tell you a, a few things about general things about language in autism. Later on we're going to talk more in detail about the studies that we're doing right now on language in autism. But um, many of you may know 
that 25 to 30% of the autistic population is actually minimally verbal or nonverbal. And what does that mean? Well, it means, as far as we can describe this, that these people, this part of the, the autistic population doesn't have productive language. We don't know so much about their comprehension of language. So that in and of itself is a, is a, would be a very interesting uh, field of research. So 25 to 30 percent minimally verbal or nonverbal. And of the verbal autistic individuals, we most of us agree that they have, uh, that they're different from neurotypicals in the pragmatic area of language. Um, and, but in addition to that, and this was traditionally not assumed that of the verbal autistic individuals, many have the, uh, of them, and in some studies we see this up to 50%, that they're different from neurotypicals in structural language. In structural language, we mean grammar, more for syntax, but also phonology as the structure of sounds. So if we take all this knowledge together about this large percentage that is minimally or nonverbal, that verbal autistic uh, individuals have problems with pr uh, at least the pragmatic part of language, but also often with structural language, it's quite surprising that language plays a very minimal role in autism diagnosis and in intervention. And it's even more surprising, and this is something that, that you people in the, in the Krell Center realize very well, I think, uh, that language is the key to social success, to academic success, to life quality, to partnerships. I mean, language is such a crucial instrument. So one of the missions of our Language in Autism Lab in Amsterdam and also of LACA is really to put it very simply, to put language on the map of autism. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, and what I wanted to add at the previous, you don't have to go back to the previous slide, is that um, what is pr pragmatics? Of course, pragmatics is a huge area in, in language. And um, it, it's basically the, the use of language in a context. And that context can be a, a text, textual written context or a spoken context. It can be a social situation, but it's language in context. And that varies from uh, turn taking when, you know, how, you, how do you know when to use a question or a declarative or an imperative um, to the choice between a definite and an indefinite article, something close to my heart is when do you choose to say a, uh, when do you choose to say the. Scalar implicatures, information structure, but also all the non-literal meaning that we get from a piece of written or oral text including inferences, figurative language, irony, idiomatic expressions, metaphors. So there's tons of research that would be very interesting to do in, in this autistic population. OK, so what about um, existing theories uh, on autism? If you browse websites on autism or of autistic um, uh, association, associations for, for autistic people, you often come across three main theories, and I will uh, go through them very uh, briefly here. The first one revolves around theory of mind, and the idea is that theory of mind is delayed or incomplete with all the repercussions, maybe for language as well. And in the second one, executive function plays a central role. It's hypothesized that uh, executive functions such as inhibition, switching, attention, working memory, that they're all incomplete or delayed, or part of them is incomplete or delayed. And the third theory uh, revolves around the idea that there is a delayed or inc incomplete acquisition of central coherence or information integration. You may or may not be familiar with, with these theories, but these are three psychological theories, I would say, that have been trying to say something about the underlying nature of autism. And I also wanted to make a couple of remarks about another non-linguistic part of cognition in autism, which is um, IQ. Well, when we're working with a potentially language impaired population, then it's very important to realize that a verbal IQ test assesses IQ through language, and that may skew the scores, right? And second, we know from previous research that low IQ does not always go hand in hand with low language ability. So, Recent research has shown that autistic people with low IQ 
can go with good language abilities and vice versa, that high IQ can go with weak language abilities. And that is something that a lot of people are not aware of. And I, this morning I was teaching a class and one of the students asked, so, so those, those um, children, those autistic children who are minimally verbal, do they always have low IQ? And that is not the case. It doesn't always go hand in hand. So I thought that would be important to point out. Um, yeah, so our, our more specific uh, LIA goals are uh, to describe the language profiles in autistic individuals and how they may or may not relate to extra linguistic cognitive abilities. And so that's a descriptive goal. And a more explanatory goal is to figure out what the underlying nature is of these language profiles and the underlying nature. We could look for them in within linguistics itself, but also within other cognition and, and also in the brain. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, in the spring of this year, our group carried out a, a project on language cognition and statistical learning with autistic adults. We had hoped to work with children, but because of COVID, we couldn't visit schools. Schools were closed, etc. You know all about it. And um, we managed to set up a, um, an online test battery through the platform Prolific. Um, and these are the tests that um, most of the tests depicted here is what we managed to administer online uh, to autistic adults. So we had tests in statistical learning and social cognition in language and some baseline cognitive tests such as uh, nonverbal intelligence and, and uh, memory uh, tests. And um, if we go to the next slide, then Ilana will take over the floor and tell you something about the part on statistical learning and after that on scalar implicatures, which is part of pragmatics. Ilana. Can you live with um, you. Ria go through the slides or do you want to request control? I've uh, requested control. I yeah. don't know from whom, but. Because you have some animations also, right? In this slide. So it might be yes. better for you to, um, to have control yourself. I have to request it again. If it's not working, then I can just say next, but it will be a lot of nexts. <laughs> Sorry, I should have foreseen this. Alternatively, I can Try to share my own. Yeah. Um, okay, hang on. I'm going to request control again because I don't seem to be able to. So what we're seeing now oh. is the slides that Maria is sharing. Ah, something is happening. Hi, um, okay, can you see the slide, uh, my slide? Okay, and yes. can you see it now in presenter mode? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, I'm Ilana Grama and uh, yeah, thank you for that nice introduction. Also, I am, I wouldn't say an expert in statistical learning, but that's definitely mostly what I've been working on in the past few years. Um, so for those of you who don't know, but I, I would assume there are very few if uh, there's already an interest in statistical learning. Um, I, I would define statistical learning as, as the ability to detect uh, patterns and regularities in the input, whether that input is uh, spoken input or auditory non-linguistic input or perhaps visual input, the ability to detect uh, structure and regularities effortlessly and offered often without being explicitly aware of it. Um, so many of you would recognize here a short demonstration of the serial reaction time task. So this is one simple way to test statistical learning and indeed one way that has been used uh, quite often with individuals with uh, autism to test their ability to uh, learn the regularity in the 
uh, movement of the um, sorry of the uh, target uh, on the screen. If you uh, look at it repeatedly, you will uh, start to see that there is a particular sequence. Um, and we know that statistical learning is uh, related in some way to language because in developmental language disorders, bo both children and adults uh, diagnosed with uh, DLD show uh, uh, systematically show a deficit in statistical learning. Uh, we also know that uh, sometimes statistical learning in some tasks correlate with the speed and efficiency with which we process complex syntactic constructions and that uh, in brain imaging studies, uh, uh, it's shown that it engages some of the same brain areas as uh, language processing. So it's immediately interesting to look at what the statistical learning abilities are in a population such as autism, which has a diversity of language profiles from, as Jeanette said, uh, uh, people who are minimally verbal to people who only exhibit subtle pragmatic deficits and otherwise uh, typical language development. Um, so this is an interesting uh, relationship to study and in fact it has been studied. Uh, people have been interested in uh, the statistical learning abilities of uh, autistic individuals uh, for a long time, uh, for decades, and um, uh, the studies that have been produced actually have quite uh, contradictory uh, findings. Some studies uh, find that uh, autistic individuals do ha uh, have uh, are challenged by these statistical learning tasks, um, although the validity of these studies is questioned based on their small samples and more recent meta analyses have not really found uh, this uh, uh, ch uh, that that this is the case. Um, fMRI studies show uh, that in, uh, autistic individuals might show uh, less brain activation uh, while they're learning. But there are also many studies that actually uh, find that uh, uh, autistic individuals are not challenged by statistical learning, that the, the for instance, the learning outcome, so uh, whether they learn, um, is is uh, not different in, in autistic populations versus neurotypical populations. Although other studies find that while while autistic individuals don't have uh, problems with statistical learning, uh, they do in fact show different learning strategies from uh, neurotypical individuals. And there are also studies that find in specific uh, test paradigms that actually individuals with uh, autism perform better than the neurotypical individuals or that within the population of autistic individuals those who show poor or social cognition more pronounced autistic traits actually show better learning so this is a very puzzling reality and um, our um, study is partly dedicated to understanding um, the why uh, these uh, these findings are so mixed and uh, to get a better understanding of what the statistical learning abilities of autistic individuals actually are and also to fit them within the broader frame of uh, language and social cognition. Does statistical learning uh, underline, uh, uh, underlie language development in autistic individuals and to what extent perhaps to a great or a lesser extent than neurotypical individuals and how is this relationship perhaps mediated by social cognition. So our aim in the past year has been to develop, be to develop better statistical learning uh, paradigms uh, which are uh, more robust at uh, identifying the true statistical learning abilities of individuals with autism. Uh, so for one we would like to have a paradigm that shows us different kinds of learning, learning of multiple uh, regularities within the same uh, statistical um, uh, input, uh, statistically structured input uh, that is uh, in a way that is most similar to natural languages. Uh, we also wanted to develop a task that is simple and accessible to individuals of different ages, IQ and uh, autism severity. Uh, so a task that is really uh, also accessible to, to children as well as adults and also to, to, to uh, minimally verbal uh, individuals or individuals with lower IQ. A task that captures not only the learning outcomes, but also looks at whether the, the trajectory of learning is different in autistic individuals and to understand the relationship between these statistical learning and of course language and social cognition measures. 
Um, so uh, in order to develop this task, we've looked at uh, some of the previous uh, research. Uh, Can we hear? I think Ilana's frozen. We, I don't hear her either. Oh, it, it, yeah, she's frozen. She may be undergoing some batch of bad connection. Yeah. It's um, um, I, I'm really sorry. I seem to have dropped out of the meeting. I, yeah, you we still hear you. We can okay. hear you. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I will uh, try to reshare. Mm -hmm. is, is this where I left you or did I drop out earlier? Here. Here. Okay. Yeah. Here. okay. At, the, at the top of the slide. Okay. Um, so I was talking about a task that we adapted that was developed by uh, other researchers like Maria Vender and uh, Doug Sadi, um, which is a task based on Fibonacci grammars. And these grammars are interesting because they display some of the structural uh, the phrase structure properties of natural languages. As you can see in A, uh, Fibonacci grammar is derived from the recursive application of some very simple rules. In this case, that zero always rewrites as a one and one one always rewrites as uh, zero one and this generates longer and longer strings that actually uh, as you can see in B this is the 11th elaboration uh, so the the 11th level of uh, uh, um, uh, recursive application of the rules which generates a very long binary string that is interesting because it displays some really interesting structural properties uh, so for instance you can see that uh, uh, in this grammar uh, a zero is always followed by a one, so all the red ones are predicted based on the fact that they are immediately after a zero. And uh, two ones are always followed by a zero, so all the yellow zeros are predictable by being preceded by uh, two ones, but also higher order regularity. So a uh, sequence zero, one, zero, one is always followed by a one, and this can be easily derived from uh, the rules and structure of the grammar because at the higher hierarchical uh, level, uh, uh, sequence zero, one, zero, one is the rewrite of a sequence one, one, uh, which predictably from rule two, must be followed by a zero. Um, so this, these kinds of grammars uh, have a series of uh, increasingly complex uh, rules. Uh, they are very simple in that they are binary. There are only two uh, sort of vocabulary uh, elements. And they're also interesting because each element in these strings is actually either predictable by one of the three rules or less predictable or what we what I will improperly call uh, random. Um, so this rule is actually uh, this uh, this grammar is actually very amenable to uh, setting up in a, a visual statistical learning task, which is what we did. Uh, so as you can see, every one in the um, uh, string corresponds to the, let's say, left hand uh, location of a stimulus on the screen and every zero corresponds to the right hand location. Uh, so you can present the uh, Fibonacci string generated in B by pre presenting sequences of these uh, stimuli presented to the left and the right, and we can see how fast uh, individual learners react to the presentation of these stimuli. So uh, to show you, this is what our statistical learning task actually looks like. So it's like a whack-a-mole game. Uh, you get these birds either on the left or on the right hand side of the screen and you need to react by pressing the left or the right corresponding button as soon as you see uh, the stimulus. And we analyze the data uh, in terms of the reaction time for each individual stimulus and we predict that when the rules have been learned, the reaction times will be faster. 
uh, for the uh, elements that are predictable according to those rules than for the elements that are unpredictable. So if you see again here for, for each rule, you can measure the reaction times separately and then compare it to the random elements to see if the reaction times are significantly slower. And so as Jeanette mentioned, we already conducted an online pilot study with adults uh, this uh, spring uh, on the platform Prolific. We found a variety of individuals that were willing to uh, uh, participate in our research. Some of them were diagnosed with autism officially. Some of them considered themselves to, uh, some of them were self-diagnosed or they believed they had autism but had no, um, uh, no official diagnosis. And some of them were uh, uh, neurotypical uh, adults. Um, and we also looked at uh, their uh, social uh, challenges by testing them on the social responsiveness scale. So what we actually found in our statistical learning task is that the simplest uh, regularity in our language was learned by both individuals with autism and neurotypical individuals, both with and without a social challenge, suggesting that in this respect, uh, there are no differences in statistical learning. But surprisingly, the more complex uh, uh, structural regularity showed the significant group difference in that the individuals with autism and uh, social uh, challenges as reflected by the social responsiveness scale were actually better learners and were the only ones that showed robust learning of this rule, whereas the neurotypical individuals did not. Neither did the self-diagnosed individuals actually. Um, and the more, most complex rule was not really learned by either group because it's a very complex uh, rule and it's actually rarely learned by more than a handful of individuals in a sample. Um, but um, yeah, you can see here in the graphs uh, how we compare the reaction times to uh, the, for instance, rule two in this case to the uh, uh, random, uh, to the non-predictable elements. And you see on the left that the neurotypical individuals uh, show an overlap and no discrimination between the two. Therefore, show no learning of rule two, whereas the individuals with autism on the uh, on the right actually show a decreasing reaction uh, time for the uh, complex adjacent, so rule two regularity in the final two blocks of learning uh, and a, a significant difference from the uh, non-predictable elements. So we also can show the trajectory of learning and the fact that, that that learning happens towards the end of the experiment. Since our individuals here were um, um, high functioning as one would say or uh, at, at least had very good IQ scores and ceiling level uh, language scores, uh, we believe that these uh, these individuals uh, are maybe have been protected in their language development by their uh, excellent uh, statistical learning skills. So we would like to extend this research with individuals with uh, lower IQ or poor language abilities to see if the uh, autism advantage still holds across the general uh, uh, spec uh, across the spectrum, or it's uh, something that is, is specifically a protective factor for individuals that uh, have strong language skills skills. And finally, um, uh, um, we were talking about the fact that we want to uh, look not only at statistical learning, but of course at how uh, language uh, and statistical learning and social cognition interact in autism. Uh, so part of my research uh, also has to do with scalar implicatures um, because they are a reflection of the use of language in a social context. So we know that language development in general is dependent on social interaction and that is something that affects individuals, uh, uh, autistic individuals in general, but we also know that there are parts of language that are specifically um, uh, centered around understanding the communicative intentions of interlocutors uh, and uh, uh, a phenomenon within this is uh, uh, the use of implicatures where uh, the listeners, uh, listener has to infer uh, what the correct communicative intentions are of the 
uh, speaker. Uh, so we know of scalar implicatures where uh, when you say on my cake, some candles are burning. Uh, that is um, pragmatically supposed to be interpreted as some but not all so that you would in on the left hand picture choose the target uh, uh, picture with some candles burning and not the competitor picture with all candles burning. And we know that implicatures can also be ad hoc when uh, you see, for instance, um, uh, several um, boys with glasses and you hear the other my friend has glasses, you infer that the speaker is being maximally informative and that therefore the boy that is referred to is the one that has only glasses and not glasses and the hat because otherwise the speaker would have also mentioned the hat. So research into scalar and ad hoc implicatures has been done extensively, including with uh, children and adults with uh, uh, autism. And we know that while adults seem to uh, have no particular problem interpreting these uh, implicatures, uh, that younger children um, may uh, perform more poorly than neurotypical children in these uh, tasks, uh, but not always. Um, the problem with these kinds of tasks is that when you present four pictures uh, that uh, really uh, give away the possible alternative interpretations of these sentences, it could be that you are in fact giving away to the child the purpose of the experiment. So in our new uh, research direction, we are uh, uh, looking at the fact uh, that uh, individuals with autism might be able to outsmart this kind of task and we are trying to develop a new task that is more naturalistic and obscures the purpose of the experiment for the uh, child or the adult um, uh, taking this experiment. Sorry. Um, so we are uh, collaborating with um, um, colleagues from uh, Utrecht, Emanuela Pinto and Shalom Zuckerman, who have developed a coloring book, an innovative uh, method of testing uh, language acquisition in children, um, where we test, for instance, scalar implicatures uh, by letting children uh, color a picture with, uh, for instance, several monkeys and uh, giving them the sentence, some monkeys are red. Uh, and instead of having the explicit alternatives for the interpretation of the scalar implicature, the children actually um, have to decide for themselves what the correct uh, coloring strategy is in order to make the uh, sentence true. So I think I've taken up enough time and I give the floor back to Jeanette. Thank you very much, Ilana. I don't know how much time do we have left, uh, uh, Maria? Yes, you have like five to ten minutes. But so then I would like to pass on the floor to Harriet because I think we would have too much otherwise. So mm -hmm. Harriet, are you able to okay. see this slide? Um, questions, including questions, you have until half past. So you have plenty of time. And yeah, you we would love to have some questions. So we'll see if we get to my bits, but I think Harriet's project is more important. Okay. All right, I'm going to do it again while I share my screen. But last time I got a bit stuck at the end and I couldn't get back to Teams to unshare. So maybe at the end someone's going to have to do that for me. Um, all right, let me find where we want to start from. From here. Yes, we can see it. Great. Um, all right, so um, I'm doing a PH project on uh, on the use and acquisition of topic, which is essentially uh, what we are talking about. Um, and what we know already from the literature is that autistic individuals may, on the one hand, produce fewer pronouns overall, yet at the same time, when they do produce uh, pronouns, they may be more likely to be ambiguous. Um, this is done their, their neurotypical peers, um, and we don't know so much about comprehension, although there are some findings to suggest that there may also be some, some difficulties with comprehension. Um, we also know that interpreting prosody, and especially when driven by pragmatics, may be challenging for autistic individuals. So how, this, uh, how the information is actually conveyed in terms of intonation, um, and we'll come back to that um, for the second study. Um, so 
firstly, I have, well, I have two studies that are sort of in progress at the moment. Fortunately, I don't have any results for either. Um, the first study is about the effect of the visual stimuli on noun phrase choice in narratives. And the second study is about, um, is a comprehension study about processing prosodic cues in order to resolve ambiguous pronouns. So, uh, firstly, for my, for my study one about noun phrase choice and visual stimuli. So, some of you may be familiar with these pictures. They come from the frog story, which is often used um, to elicit narratives um, and generally discourse from participants in order to then later analyze it. So essentially, we give them the pictures and then they talk and then we analyze this as, um, as a block of discourse. But um, often what happens in this process is that this then gets um, dissociated from the pictures, which is the original context. And in these pictures, um, the, the discourse itself is already kind of split into separate events. Um, and then the speaker, of course, has a choice of what to do with that. They can uh, describe each event individually, they can join them together, they can split each uh, event into smaller sub-events and so on. And um, the way that we conceptualize and then talk about um, events um, like this has an effect on the noun phrases that we use. So if you start talking about something um, with a full noun phrase, like the boy, this kind of shows that you are um, creating a new section of discourse, whereas if you refer um, to a referent as like he throughout the discourse, then you're creating some sort of coherence between, um, between your utterances and therefore between parts of the discourse. Um, and so you are kind of connecting events um, by, using, um, by using more pronouns. Um, so this has been shown in um, typical in neurotypical speakers um, that we have this tendency to do this. Um, and so what this made me think about is that we, uh, well, we collected this data with our narrative task, but um, ultimately the way that we present the, the task, does this have an effect on the noun phrases that they use? So do their noun phrase choices reflect um, the visual discourse segmentation? Um, and does this actually differ between autistic and neurotypical speakers? Um, and we may think that it does because um, previous findings have, um, have found that autistic speakers um, may um, connect events less in their discourses. And of course, we also know that there is this uh, general tendency for them to use more full noun phrases in general, so less pronouns. And so could these two things be linked? Could it be that actually they are just segmenting the discourse into smaller sections? So that's something that I would like to look at. And then um, I would also like to look at the fact that um, in terms of ambiguous pronouns, when, when again, when uh, shown all these pictures and asked to present, uh, to produce a discourse, um, the speaker has to, um, when they are shown a new picture, they have to take in the events in the new picture. They have to remember what the events in the previous picture were. They have to remember what they said about it and plan their current utterance. And so as we change pictures in the narrative, in the narrative we, uh, we may actually be putting our participants um, under increased cognitive load. And so is it at these points that, um, that people start uh, producing more ambiguous pronouns? And might this be um, affected by working memory abilities? And so um, the way that I'm looking at the data is I'm taking two contexts from narratives, um, contexts where a pronoun would be felicitous. You don't have to use a pronoun, but we kind of expect that people um, in many of these cases would. Um, and then on the other hand, cases where a pronoun would be potentially ambiguous. And then where um, you could use a pronoun. We are then looking at when people don't use the pronoun and instead use a full noun phrase um, and how this might be related to discourse segmentation. And on the other hand, when people use um, a, a pronoun where it could be potentially ambiguous, we will look and see whether that is related to the cognitive load, both, both of these relating to um, how the pictures then interact. 
Um, so we have again from the same data collection as Liana described, um, we recorded um, narratives from 12 autistic participants with a diagnosis. There are also five um, self-identifying who gave us narratives and we have 25 neurotypical participants. Um, so first of all, I would like to do a group analysis where we take um, all of the autistic participants and we match them as best as we can on gender, age and IQ to um, neurotypical participants. And then I would also like to do an analysis of social responsiveness scale um, scores so that we can um, use that as an alternative alternative way of measuring this um, and using more of the population. Um, and so we collected frog story narratives uh, via Zoom and they've been transcribed um, and now need to be coded. Um, and then for working memory, we used an NBAC task. Then moving on to uh, my second study, which is about um, the comprehension of ambiguous pronouns. Um, if we have a, a series of um, of sentences like this. Um, Elena was happy after the tennis tournament. The silver medal was a great achievement. The coach applauded proudly at the prize ceremony. For the next tournament, though, she hopes for gold. In the last sentence, we have the pronoun she, and this could refer to either Lena or the coach. Um, so if I ask you who hopes for, go for gold, um, some people might say um, Lena and some people might say the coach. And ultimately what this depends on is whether you take this middle section of the discourse as being a subordinate structure, which is therefore telling you more about Lena and why she was happy. Um, or she was happy because the silver medal was great and the coach was really happy with her. Um, and so then for the next tournament though, she is Lena, we're still talking about Lena. Or on the other hand, if we see these as a series of coordinate um, sentences, then um, we start talking about Lena, then we start talking about the silver medal, then we talk about the coach, and then it makes more sense that she is the coach, as this is who we were most recently talking about. Um, and we can also manipulate this in the prosody to um, suggest one or other of the structures. Um, so we can do this by taking the pitch range, which is what is represented in these um, diagrams, um, and also the pause length. And so in a subordinate um, representation of this discourse, um, we, well, we always start with expanded when we're talking about something new, and then it goes to normal compressed to show that something is ending, and then a longer pause, and we go back to expanded, which kind of creates a, um, a bridge back to um, the first sentence and to Lena, and so then, um, it triggers that we're still talking, we're going back to talking about Lena, whereas when it is coordinate, um, we can go from expanded, normal, normal and compressed to show that this is just one chunk of discourse. And it's been uh, shown previously for German that although it's um, perhaps not as big a difference as we might like, that um, neurotypicals are sensitive to this and they do perform differently um, depending on these conditions. Um, and so what we would like to do is take the same paradigm and use it with autistic and neurotypical teenagers. Um, and so we would like to know whether these global prosodic cues affect how adolescents resolve ambiguous pronouns. Um, are there any differences between autistic and neurotypical adolescents? Um, and so we would test such high school students who are um, that's 12 plus uh, we will have an autistic and a neurotypical group with roughly 30 members per group. Um, and we will also uh, have a short working memory task as a control. So we use the backward digit span um, just as by listening to the um, to the stimuli, they do have to, to some extent, remember what happened in the discourse. So just to check that this is not having an effect. Um, and we're currently working on an online pilot with neurotypical adults um, just to check the task design. Um, and it will look roughly like this. So they will listen to um, one of the two prosodic manipulations um, and then they will be asked who hopes for gold. And so they make a connection, hopes for gold, is it Lena or, or the coach? And then they press uh, keys on the, on the keyboard to select uh, which person they associate with this, uh, with this fragment. But that is 
uh, everything. I kind of raced through that because I know that we want to have uh, time for questions. Um, so maybe now I will attempt to stop sharing my screen. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, both. Very interesting.